Good afternoon. Today is April 2nd, and this is Dave Baldwin here with Baldwin Systems. I've got two great guests with me for, for today's interview. This is, we have Lou Everett and Sherry McManus. They're here from the Lou Everett Group. And I'll just tell you a little bit about them and uh, we'll, we'll kick things off pretty quickly here. But Lou and Sherry are, they're known for their highly effective coaching, teaching and speaking on the importance of personal growth and how it affects our influence as a leader. And with more than four decades of combined experience in training, coaching and leadership, they have also received mentoring from the well-known and successful coaches and teachers from the likes of Tony Robbins, Zig Ziglar, Brian Tracy, John Maxwell, Jack Canfield, Paul Martinelli, and the certified leadership coaches and corporate trainers. That, that's their title. And so would you please welcome the owners of the Lou Everett Group, Lou Everett and Sherry McManus. So Lou and Sherry, do you want to uh, just say a little bit about yourselves and your business to kind of start things off? Sure. Thanks, Dave, for having us. This is uh, it's, it's always fun to, to be on the show and to do what we can to support you and your listeners. So why don't you take it away? So what, I'm sure you have a lot that you can add to that too. <laughs> well, no, he did a fabulous job. I think he did he, too. I think he did. <laughs> well, that pretty much states it, right? I know there. that pretty much states yeah. it. I mean, the only thing I want to add is that you know we love transforming today's leaders. Our, mm -hmm. our real, you know, our focus is that leadership development and effective communication for small businesses. You know, we really, we really love doing that so much. Um, for, it's really in our core of our values is to really help people and being people centric is key. So mm -hmm. that's, that's the only thing I want to add. Done. That's, that's hundred yeah. percent true. Yep. And uh, we are a husband and wife duo. Um, we started our first business 2005, realized uh, that we, we were, we were cut out for being partners, not just in life, but in business. So uh, we're excited about what it is that we do um, and look forward to, to zoom. We can add some value to you and your listeners today. Appreciate it, Dave. Perfect. Well, I thought it was, I was really interested, you know, we've, we've known each other a few months now and, I, and I've learned a few different things about, about, about what you guys do. And, and I think one of the things that, it, that was, it intrigued me about uh, today's interview for anyone who's watched any of the other videos, one of the things that I like to focus on is the intersection of people and technology and mm -hmm. how technology has changed pretty much over any period of time that you can look at over the last 50 to 100 years, but especially over the last two or three years, we've had a couple of changes related to the COVID-19 pandemic. But one of the things that I, I thought would, that Sherry and Lou could to talk a little bit about today is how the, the world of leadership and the conversation of leadership has shifted in, in, in terms of how some technology changes have, have changed the way the workplace looks. And I, I thought it'd be interesting to look at some of the things that, that haven't changed versus what has changed but specifically, just kind of looking back over the last 10 years, just in, in that time frame, what, what are your thoughts as far as, you know, what, what's different versus what's the same about leadership in, in terms of, you know, the way the world is today? Yeah, well, technology is, has definitely come a long way. And there's kind of two different roads here, I think, that, that we can talk on when it comes to technology and how that's impacted the workplace, particularly at the leadership level. Um, because you see, there was a time when metrics and numbers and knowing where your teams are, where they're headed and how close to goals, uh, that it really hadn't, technology hadn't been developed enough for, for that to really be able to be in real time. Whereas now, right now, that's the big focus using technology for documentation metrics, seeing where the teams are, where they're headed, where, 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 where how they're being, uh, how they're achieving their goals specifically. So that's like one avenue, and it certainly has changed the dynamics because the world, the world of business is a competitive market, and you have to, in order to be competitive, the bottom line is important, right? And so in order for you to understand where the bottom line is, uh, and a company, especially if you're leading uh, large teams, um, those, those, that technology is extremely important to know where, where your people are when it comes down to achieving their goal, right? Now, that's the bottom line piece you know, financials, which is important for a leader. Uh, however, there's a very, other big important piece to that is uh, engagement. Um, and engagement has certainly changed uh, drastically in the last year because of, of COVID-19 and some of the other things that have happened and have kind of forced people into uh, remote working, which is another topic we can probably get into um, that technology certainly has played a big role in. Um, 
but that from a technology perspective, there's definitely been some significant changes over the last 10 years. Some for the better, some not so well, uh, all mainly because of transition um, and, and of companies not being able to conform to the new technologies or to the new generations coming in that use those technologies, right? So there is there is a lot of talk. We could probably talk for the whole uh, a whole hour on this, Dave. But um, but there's definitely been significant change uh, from that perspective on how leaders are able to manage their people. Well, I, I think you make a really good point about the the financial side and the accounting tools and, and thinking to you know it wasn't that long ago when you couldn't really monitor a lot of different things in real time that you can now because. It, you know, just I'm thinking about how it used to be that people turned in accounting reports at close of business every day and you couldn't see any numbers. And, and that was even assuming that the computer systems were sophisticated enough to even track it on a daily basis. Right. Sometimes right. it might yeah. lag behind by a week or a month, especially when more and more of it was done on paper versus now right. it's kind of like you can pull up and see more of a real time minute to minute view of a lot more things. So that's that's a really interesting piece from the accountability side of things. Now, one, one area that, that I've just been really curious about is how what, what now we think about as the, the new normal of more people working from home, uh, mainly driven in that direction by COVID-19. But I just noticed how a lot of companies started down that path with the mentality of, we'll just do this temporarily. And then they decided, well, you know, this, this is actually working out pretty well. Why don't we just keep doing this? So I'm, I'm just kind of, there's a couple of aspects of that for me that I've noticed uh, as far as from a leadership standpoint, I have to imagine there's got to be people in organizations that your job fundamentally changes when you're used to everybody reporting to the same office and used to being able to just walk down the hall and talk to somebody face to face. And now it's, it's I've got to do it over a Zoom call or, or a phone call. And, and now perhaps you've got people working in different time zones and all that kind of stuff. Uh, what, what's been your take on that? Yeah, um, that's true. It's, there's been a lot of change over the last year. Did you want to take that one or mention some things on that one? There's definitely some specifics that uh, mm -hmm. we have seen and encountered with companies um, overall mm -hmm. and clients. You know, we work with organizations and companies and of course even that relationship kind of needs to take an adjustment mm -hmm. and, and a lot of things that we need to look at too when it comes down to it dave um because of the remote work transition it's important for us to fully understand as leaders that those that we lead now that they're working remote have different variances of environments right there's there's cultural differences there's environment differences and the challenge comes into place where we need to try to sit back and try to understand that so that we can then um, add value and develop those people working remotely and how they can manage that. Because not everyone's mm -hmm. been trained or taught or developed on how to manage themselves ind independently from a remote location. And so it's our responsibility as a leader to make sure that our, our people and our teams are, are trained and equipped to be able to be successful in that in that environment working remotely um i think something you'll see with us a lot we we uh, as, as leaders we, we have the burden and responsibility for our people in everything and if we have to transition to something like remote work i tell you there's companies that had a very difficult time with this <laughs> many of up for for years have had a uh, at, at a no tolerance policy for working from home. <laughs> it didn't exist even up until as, as late as last year before the pandemic that so many companies were just so set against it. Um, and the question comes into play is why? And we've asked over the several years to companies, well, why, why are you so against it? And uh, you'll never believe the answers that you get. It's our policy. That's what you get. Yeah. Well, why is it the policy, right? <laughs> when it boils down to, though, Dave, is that they don't know how to manage remote workers. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it sounds like it's, it's one of those things where we're, we're used to doing it this way. And so we're not changing kind of like that. And, and I think right. that's pretty typical with a lot of different technologies that require people to change their habits. I mean, I, yeah. I can still remember how around uh, the late 90s, there was, there was more businesses that didn't have computers and I, I can still remember talking to some people that said, I'm never going to use a computer. We do things on paper <laughs> and that's the way it is. Yeah. And, and that's, that's how it has to be in this line of work. But uh -huh. yeah, I, I think there's 
so there it's it's interesting to see the different um, it, it comes to mind I mean, if, you're, if you're familiar with the uh, the law of the fusion of innovation but mm -hmm. uh, the idea that you know some people are going to be more receptive to any kind of new technology than others so i kind of look at remote work as is really it's just it, it's pretty much the same as any other technology that's ever been introduced it's just is that some people are motivated to change their behaviors because they want a different result and other people if they're already getting the results they want with the way it is then why should they change that's kind of the mentality so mm -hmm. yeah no, that's very true and it's uh and it comes down to trust too you know there's a little bit of a there's more even uh, beyond the technology piece it comes to a deeper root um a lot of times there's a deeper rooted issue there uh, there is you know, a good example. It was a company last year, you know, up before last year. Uh, they are a technology company. They, they, they people are techies. Uh, they, they train and teach people on uh, in IT too. And, and so they're very familiar with technology, understand technology very well, understand the benefits of technology, but they did not allow people to work from home. So what is the challenge there? What's the reason? And the root of that reason is, Two things, trust, trusting in your, your people and your employees and not knowing how to manage people remotely. That's a big challenge. Well, yeah, and, and I think the, the, the trust side is really huge for anything because I think that if, if trust isn't in a relationship, then people will probably be more likely to stick with what they're comfortable with because the, the more the more I have to venture outside of my comfort zone into something I don't understand and I'm not familiar with, the more I have to trust the people I'm working with. So I could definitely see there being a relationship there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that can create a lot of diversion, right? A lot, a lot of separation. Um, because if you're not trusting your employees, do you think they're going to trust you? Right. You see, it's, it's uh, definitely a two way street. Yeah. 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 So, um, so the technology definitely can, can, but uh, it's always beneficial if we use it in the way that it's meant to be used. Right. That's right. what I was going to say. If you use it correctly, I mean, there was a lot of, uh, I mean, look at the, the innovation that came out because of this pandemic mm -hmm. of working remotely. Um, virtually has always been, but just really a lot of people didn't want to use it. Right. And until they were backed in the corner and that was the way that, that was one of the ways that they needed to communicate to see face-to-face -face, other mm -hmm. than a phone call. And then there's other apps that are the, was it the, the WhatsApp? I think if I'm mm -hmm. saying that right. That's uh, that's you know, that's one, one. Chat, yeah. um, you yeah. know, those, those, uh, you know, an IM situation where it's instant. So that way you didn't have to really carve out another mm -hmm. 30, 30 minute phone call. Mm -hmm. um, however, if it's used effectively, it can really keep everything going. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's just a matter of equipping leaders of how to use that correctly uh, with that. So I think that that has been a, a very common theme of, well, how do I, how do I lead from remotely? From a distance. From a distance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. No. And I think that's, that's a big piece of it is, is how do you, how do you effectively do your job as a leader when you're having, when you don't have the luxury of having everybody right in that same geometric footprint or uh, geological footprint you know what i mean um right. the other right. piece I, I thought we should touch on a little bit is just looking at the last 10 years uh how social media has become much more prevalent i mean i remember even in 2010 2011 a lot, a lot of people still didn't have facebook accounts a lot of people right. still weren't on right. linkedin a lot of companies yeah. kind of didn't really take it seriously it was like this is kid stuff we don't really need mm -hmm. this you know, let's mm -hmm. just do it old school with, I mean, I, it wasn't even that much longer ago when people still didn't, didn't even buy into email. So, yeah. you know, two doesn't right. like so, but over the last 10 years, I'm just noticing how much more of the conversation that used to happen, like more people are consuming media through those, those social channels, but from a leadership and a company and organizational standpoint, I, I'm just noticing how, how much more transparency that there is for better or for worse and how much work lives blend, bleed into personal lives and how much whatever my employees are talking about online, well, everybody can see that they work for my company and now everybody's a mouthpiece for my company, whether I necessarily want them to be or not. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm just really curious as to what you've seen there from how, how has that changed from, from a leader's standpoint 
how do you even manage when everybody in the company is is basically a mouthpiece for the organization and and everything everybody does can, is is fully visible online and potentially could impact the way your brand is perceived yeah that's very it's a very good question uh and it, it certainly does impact that right because uh, it, because whether or not you're home or you're working if you're working for a company and as a leader we're always concerned with um what you know, what type of reputation does our company hold? And um, we want to have upstanding employees to be able to represent our core values, whether they're home or at work, right? Um, even though we want to separate that, but it is important for us to, uh, to kind of dig in there. And what it comes down to, Dave, is I believe is transparency from both sides. A company that's transparent with their teams and with their people um, again, it comes down to trust. Do you trust them? Do they trust you? If they trust you and you have a good relationship with your employees uh, and your culture is in such a way where people love coming to work every day, then um, you're not going to have to worry too much about anybody uh, you know, damaging the reputation of the company overall. But then even, even down to the specifics, right? I mean, you know, when you hire people, part of the onboarding process is uh, and their training and their equipping is, hey, listen, this is what we expect, how your behavior on social media, this is what we expect our employees to be, how we expect them to behave, mm -hmm. setting those expectations um, and holding up those expectations. Um, so it's just about expectations, allowing people to be them, uh, allowing, allowing them their freedom and their, um, their choice of, of, of what it is that they do. Uh, but also being transparent with, okay, but this is what we expect you and how we expect you to handle social media. So it becomes just a matter of addressing that with employees and setting those expectations, really. And I think there's also kind of looking at on the positive side of it and some of the opportunities that have developed. I'm noticing that there's a handful of people that on my LinkedIn where they'll, they'll post about the company they're working for and they'll be like, look, look this is a great company and I've got a great team and I feel blessed to be working here and all that kind of stuff. And then once in a while, I'll see somebody saying, hey, we're, uh, my company's hiring or where it's a company they work for, this company's hiring. And I, I'm just, I have to figure that there's some better opportunities that are showing up or you know, people that are finding those opportunities that they probably would not have found out about through conventional channels, just because we're, we have that ability to stay connected at least to, to some degree where it's, it's people that we probably just wouldn't have any contact with otherwise, but very yeah. True. Very true. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry. You're going to say something. No, no, that was very, you know, what you said was absolutely hundred percent accurate. I mean, that's, it's a matter of leveraging that, that ability. Right. And in a, a leader, we always have to be futurist thinkers, right? We've got to look at, um, look ahead and, and see how the, what it is that's available is going to, how we can use that to the advantage of the company and to our business for the betterment of not just the bottom line, but for the people that work for us. Uh, and, and by doing that, we can leverage those things like you're mentioning. Like, okay, we've got now the majority of the workforce is working from home in, in, in that type of uh, environment, if it's, a, if it's something they can do, they've been moved to working from home remotely. Well, what are we doing to equip those to say, hey, listen, uh, here's a great example, you know, especially if you have a sales teams, I want you to spend 10 minutes out of your day going through LinkedIn and connecting up and meeting new people in this particular demographic so that we then might have new leads moving forward, creating relationships, using that as opposed to now, you know, we went from like don't you're saying, don't use it at all, right? I don't use, yeah, <laughs> don't use it at I don't all. Use it at all. <laughs> well, you know, you're moving from where you have a company that has their in-house marketing team mm. that does all that. So now everyone's remote. Why would you not? leverage that now you've got literally a marketing force mm -hmm. that you can use and leverage uh, in a way that's going to help benefit you and your business yeah it was interesting i remember i read about years back ibm did something like that it was they, it was a program they hold, had it was called lessening for leads and they actually had engineers go into chat rooms where people were asking questions about the rfp process and they said uh, that it was great about it because the engineers <laughs> have a really in-depth conversation that got right to people's pain points. 
And then they basically just had to train them to identify buying signals for when it was a real opportunity. And then at that point, they, they were trained to get a member of the sales team to take the conversation from there because they said they didn't want the engineers to have to be salespeople, but they had, uh, apparently they had a good deal of success with that when, when they learned yeah. how, you know, so, so, and I think when you separate the marketing side of things and the identifying the opportunity from, from the sales, there is, yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. And there's, I think we've barely begun to even tap into what opportunity is out there from, right. from leveraging that technology in that particular way, probably mainly just because it's, it's not, it's not the, the business as usual that everyone's used to, but yeah, that's, right. no, that's a really good point. Very different, yeah. So, you know, what the last major piece that I wanted to, to get into, actually, there's two other pieces. They're, they're somewhat related, but, you know, when I think about the, the different generations and how, you know, so I'm right stuck between Generation X and the Millennials. I'm not really sure mm -hmm. which one I fall into, but I've, <laughs> I've never had a job, the same job for more than four years. And that's not always been voluntary. Like my first real job out of college, the, the facility shut down and I was laid off after four years and, you know, versus, and it was, I remember just, it was an interesting seeing the mindset change that from even between when, when I was in high school and when I went into college, when I was in high school, my teachers were telling us, you know, at least the ones that I remember were, was, well, you're, you're thinking in terms of getting a job that you're going to stay at for the next 20 to 30 years. But mm -hmm. by the time I was in college, that conversation was changing and it was, well, now people move jobs more often. And I remember the first thing I, that I heard one college professor say was, it, you know, the, the days of reporting to work and being told what to do are coming to an end. And it's your, the, the expectation of self-management is much greater than what it used to be. But so I'm just, I'm just curious, have you observed any, like, as far as I know that in any organization, you've got people that are baby boomers generation X and, and they always have different expectations and there's some degree of friction sometimes because the expectations don't match. Uh, what, what's been your take on that? Like th these last five to 10 years have you have you come across that with, with any of the work that you've done? Sure. Uh, it's, it's interesting because we are now in a very interesting situation in the workforce in the workplace, because we are now in a situation where all five major generations are working. It's interesting. Uh, they're all in the workplace. Uh, you know, we got the traditionalists, the before the boomers, you got the boomers, you've got uh, you know, the, the generation X and Y and, and Z. I mean, you're looking at, um, you know, all of them being in the workplace, which means that we as leaders really have to hone in on what drives them, right? And talk to that so that we can have success and, and, and leverage it. Like, a, you know, when it comes on to anything else, I mean, you take you know, uh, Gen Y and Z. I mean, they're they're all about technology, yeah. and millennials too. But those two in particular are just so in uh, in into technology that and independence, right? They're both both generations. They really want to have independence, mm -hmm. and they have this entrepreneur mind, entrepreneurial mindset, uh, uh, and they, they want to sink sink their feet into something, including millennials. Sir. So millennials through Z want to sink their feet into something that has purpose mm -hmm. and, that, a, you know. and a bigger purpose too yeah. you know i mean it, it it sounds kind of you know big but but it you know they want to save the world in a sense mm -hmm. you know they want to make this world a better place for the next generation and beyond yeah. and you know as a leader it is our responsibility to to educate ourselves that each what are what are the essence of each of the uh, of these generations mm -hmm. and even if you take the generations out what is the essence of of the decades what what is that about mm -hmm. so i think it's i can't stress that enough with leaders or maybe a new leader into a position is that you have to educate yourself mm -hmm. and because you know just because one way works for one individual is not going to work for another mm -hmm. and unfortunately there are businesses out there that were like well this is how it always is and this is what my generation was, and this is just how it is, right? Well, you can't tell that to a different person that, that that has no idea what your background in that history doesn't have that same history, right? So that that's I think the most important thing that we have to understand a little bit of each, and then make the connection and see what motivates them. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, it, the, the, the the interesting percentage right now. Right now, we're uh, 
probably a little more now, but 37% of the workforce is our millennials, Gen Y, right? And so if we're at 37%, which makes up the majority of the workforce, what are we doing to communicate with them in a way that is going to make them happy at work and leverage their, their, the brilliance that they have uh, to, because their entrepreneurial approach, why would we want, not want to, want to use that? Right, but there's a specific way to communicate with each of these generations to make it effective um, to for them. Because when it comes down back down to it again, as you're mentioning, and we might even get into this. Well, yes, you already talked about it. How even my, my father-in-law is an example. Well, my father, my my father um, retired from the from the military, but her father worked for the same company for till he retired, and and you know got the gold watch and all that whole thing, you know, and, and it's. It doesn't, you know, for 40 years or whatever it was, it's like, it doesn't really exist now. Um, and, and it has everything to do with how we are connecting with these generations that are working in the workforce today. What are we doing to keep them? That's the big question. Yeah, in order to know what, how to, how to keep your people, retain them, so that your retention and attrition stays where it's supposed to be. So you don't have to continuously spending thousands, up to millions of dollars a year in retraining people because people are leaving, is to identify what it is that drives them. What is it that they want in, in a business and at work? Because reality of it is, millennials, it's not about money. Gen Z, not about the money. They don't care. They like the money. But if it comes down to it, if they're not feel like they're being listened to in the workforce, they can be paid all the money that you give them, but they're going to leave. They're going to go somewhere else for, for less money because they feel they have a purpose and they're being hurt. What are we doing to leverage that, right? It, it, it's a classic example of how it, it's almost like you've got, when you said there's five generations all working at the same time, it, it, it's almost like I'm talking to, to five people that speak five different languages. So I've got, <laughs> yeah. I've got you know, English over here and Spanish over here and, and Russian over here. And how do I make it make sense to everybody? So yeah. it's, right. it's, yeah, it, it almost seems like a lot, of, a lot of the solution has to come down to having more one-on-one -on -one conversations and sending out less generic memos. And which mm -hmm. to me, like the, the generic memo is the, the hierarchical one size fits all kind of a way of communicating of I, I'm the boss and, and this is going to be the way it goes because I said so, which to me is, is probably the fastest way to lose the Gen Y and Z audience yes. is to come across that way. Yes, so. it is. Yeah. Anybody comes down to making big company announcements, right? Mm -hmm. One paragraph is all you need to address all five. If, because you can say the same thing five different times and it's going to work. So it's just, it's just being intentional about, about um, understanding, caring for, and, and making sure that your people are hearing you, not just listening, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, that's, that was where all the major points that I had today. I think this has been really good, but uh, let me just, just to kind of wrap things up, do you guys have any last thoughts, anything that you want to share or uh, anything else that comes to mind? No, I would just want to, I want to encourage uh, all your listeners and anyone that um, that we're all leaders in some way. Okay. So I don't, I don't, uh, we, we always try to, you know, a lot of times we talk to people and they say, well, well, but I'm really not a leader. Leader is not about position. So make sure you, you fully get that, right? It's not about position. Leadership is influence. That's what it is. It's how, it's how we influence other people, whether it's a good influence or a bad influence, it's how we influence people that makes us a leader, uh, whether it's in your family or whether it's in your community or whether it is a position of leadership in a company. It's all about how you influence those around you that in a way that connects with them to accomplish the bottom line because you as a leader is responsible for the bottom line. You don't have to trickle that pressure down. It's how you influence them to want to work with you and want to work for you, not because they have to, because they want to, right? That's really the goal here. And the way we do that is by influence. But that starts with us. It starts with us, uh, each one of us. It starts with us, ends with us, which means we've got to develop ourselves first before we can expect anybody else to develop themselves to change so i just wanted to leave that message out there because that is what that's our root is uh is, is making sure that we focus on our development as a leader and as a person before we can develop other people 
And I, and I think that's a really good, good positive note to end on here that it's, it's actually good news for a lot of people that you don't have to wait for the official promotion to come down from on high to start exercising leadership ability, because when right. it's not, you know, you're not focused on getting people to do what you say because they have to, but they're going along with it because they want to. I think it's a, it's a really good message. And uh, so I, th I think uh, just to kind of to close things off, uh, what's the best place for people to find out about you and your company? Yeah, just reach out to us. We are uh, louevertgroup.com. Uh, we are on LinkedIn. We are on Facebook. And we're also on Instagram as well. All right. Just go to Great. Google well, and type in, go to yeah. Google and type <laughs> in the Lou Everett Group and we're everywhere. So you'll find us. Perfect. And I'll make sure you get that information in the description box of this video when it's live. Yeah. But uh, thank you, Lou and Sherry, for being with us today. It's been a great interview. And no, uh, everybody, that's all for now. We'll see you next time. You bet. Thanks, Dave. Thank you.